welcome to My Favorite Mystic, a podcast about the weird and wonderful world of mysticism. I'm AJ Langley, and today I'm joined by Gemma Simmons. She's a sister of the Congregation of Jesus and a senior lecturer in pastoral theology based at the Margaret Beaufort Institute of Theology, where she is director of the Religious Life Institute. Gemma, thank you for being here. My pleasure. So today you're going to speak to us about the founder of your order, Mary Ward. But before we get into her, can you tell us a little bit more about you? How did you become interested in mysticism as a field of study? Okay, so, I mean, mysticism as a subject, I lecture in Christian spirituality and therefore have been kind of inhabiting this world for a very long time, both in terms of being an academic subject, but also as a religious sister myself, I try and inhabit this world internally. And Mary Ward founded the first ever female religious order modelled on the Jesuit religious order, the one founded by St. Ignatius Loyola. And one of Ignatius's big things was finding God in all things, and as it were, the mysticism of the ordinary, the mysticism of every day. And that's definitely where Mary Ward is coming at this too. And I've been interested both from a spiritual and academic perspective, but also from a personal perspective, not only in trying to live this out for myself, but I do quite a lot of spiritual direction. I train people to be spiritual directors, to accompany other people in their spiritual journey. And therefore, it's of great interest to me to see and to listen to other people's experiences and see how they live out that intimate personal relationship with God in the context of their ordinary everyday life. And speaking of everyday life, what came first, becoming a sister of the Congregation of Jesus or having this as an academic interest? Oh, definitely becoming a sister. I entered the novitiate when I was 18 and entered the religious life, but I'd actually been brought up by the sisters because I went to a Mary Ward school at the age of three and a half, and I came out the other end when I was 17 and then had a wild and woolly year in Paris and then entered the novitiate. So I've only actually had four and a half years of my life outside the Mary Ward family. And, you know, the first three and a half of those, I was barely conscious. So so it very much feels as if this is in my DNA, you know. So what made you want to get more involved in the academic side of religious teaching? Well, at the time, and this is part of our historical reality, I mean, Mary Ward was hugely keen on developing the role of women in the church and in society. In 1617, she gave a speech to her sisters that they recorded. So we've got a transcript of it, which says, there is no such difference between men and women that women may not do great things. And I hope it will be seen in time to come that women will do much. Now that's 1617. That's centuries before Mary Wollstonecraft or the suffrage movement, but she is right there in a voice of seeing the huge importance of truly believing in the equality of women and men before God. And I think that's something that appealed to me immensely, even as a child. I've got it from my mother and my grandmother and my aunt, and the female figures in my family have always been very important. But that chimed in hugely with my education as well, by women who'd been attracted by that sort of a mindset and that kind of spirituality. And it fits very much with the kind of Ignatian vision of God in all things. So uh, historically, we, we ran schools and we had five schools here in the UK. And I became a school teacher after I did my first degree and loved teaching, loved being with young people, loved being with people whose minds were opening. And I got very sick, sadly, in my early 30s, had to give that up, went on all sorts of ventures and ended up finally retraining in spirituality. So training to accompany other people's spiritual journey. But also that in its time led me into theological studies. And from there, a mixture, therefore, of both pastoral outreach and actually thinking, This stuff is really exciting, really worth thinking about, and I'd love to write about this stuff. I only know one way of doing that, and that's to become an academic. So that's where I went. That's great. Now let's move on to Mary Ward herself. Can you tell us a little bit about her life? Sure. So she was born in England in 1585 to a family that had already suffered a great deal for its Catholic faith. This was the height of the state persecution of Catholics in Britain. 
And, you know, when she was very, very small or just around the time of her birth, Margaret Clitheroe, a butcher's wife, was pressed to death in York for her Catholic faith. St. Edmund Campion, who was a Jesuit, was hung, drawn and quartered at Tyburn in London for being a Catholic priest. The monasteries had all been suppressed and dissolved in the 1530s. So already by the time she was born, people had a memory of monastic life that was 50 years already dead because they'd not seen it, apart from a very short little blaze of glory in Mary Tudor's time. So that had already become part of memory, but not part of lived experience. And like many other recusant families, her grandmother did 15 years in prison for her faith. Her aunt spent the first five years of her married life in prison for her faith. She had a cousin who was a priest who was executed for being a priest. So this was very much the background, sort of the hiddenness of the Catholic faith. And she didn't know anything about religious life except by stories, hearsay, that she heard from the servants at home and different people who told her these tales. But by the age of 15, she was certain that God was calling her to religious life. So the only model she had for that was the monastic life. So the life that had been previously lived in the UK by Benedictines and Paul Clares and all of this. So after a great deal of struggle with her family, who actually wanted her to make a dynastic marriage and further the Catholic cause, she managed to escape to go across the sea to what was then the Spanish Netherlands. It's actually near Calais now to Saint-Omer, where she entered the Paul Clare Monastery, thought, oh, fantastic, my life's dream is achieved. This is great. And it all went horribly wrong. She realized it was not for her. There were difficulties because the sisters had rather misled her as to the kind of life she was meant to be leading and all of this. And she was left relying on no one but God, all the people around her who should have given her good advice, who should have been able to offer wisdom for various reasons of kind of vested interest, didn't do this. And so she was left clinging to God alone and thought, I can only go with what I believe is the truth. And the truth is, this is not right. So she left. Then there was the possibility of founding a new monastery of Port Clares for English women alone, because there were more and more English women escaping to the continent to become nuns. And she put all her dowry money, all the money she had for, you know, establishing herself in the world into that venture. Where does she get the authority to do this? I mean, living in a pre-existing community is one thing, but to start a completely new one, that could be quite a different matter. Oh, it was clear that there were cultural differences between the local sisters from the Spanish Netherlands, so they would have been Flemish mostly, and women coming from England, and these tensions were getting really quite difficult. So I think it was thought, you know what, let's make a place for ourselves where we can do this within our own culture. And it was the authorities, the novice mistress and various people who thought this was a great idea, and they saw this very, very intelligent, very strong and courageous and determined and honest young woman who had money. And they thought, oh, great, this is just what we're looking for. And again, you know, reading between the lines, I kind of feel there was a bit of self-interest going on there. But she gave it everything she had. And she was very, very happy and thought, oh, at last I can breathe and settle down. And this is great. And then there came at her out of nowhere an absolute conviction. No, not this, not this either. And she writes and says all she knew was that it was some other thing. But what or of what nature, I could not know or I didn't know. And so she left and came back to England, where she ended up living in the kind of Catholic underground in London, where she worked alongside Jesuit priests who were on the English mission. You know, they were doing this at danger of their lives. And the men who were in this, who knew how perilous it was for them, also realized that actually it was easier for women to get out and about and to go unnoticed because nobody thought women were dangerous. Nobody thought women were going to do anything subversive. So she and a group of young companions began effectively to work like Jesuits in the Catholic underground. And her first, what I would want to call mystical experience, came in 1606 
when she was in London. She was living near what's now Charing Cross Station. She was living in the Strand and she'd been praying. And she says in her notes, my meditation was cold and not to my satisfaction. So it's quite a comfort to me to know that occasionally the founders of my order had rubbish experiences at prayer, you know, (laughs) because I think that sense of, of kind of not being able to make things happen is very common in the spiritual life. And it's quite good to know that dryness or dissatisfaction in prayer, getting nowhere, is a common experience of the saints. But like most of the saints, she just kind of stuck with it. And then she says that something very spiritual befell me. And it was when she was actually getting dressed and doing her hair. And we have this wonderful series of 50 paintings that were painted during her lifetime or just after called The Painted Life, and they're held in our convent in Augsburg in Bavaria, which is our our oldest house. And there's this brilliant picture of Mary Ward sitting like Rapunzel with this long golden hair, kind of, you know, combing her hair, in front of a mirror. And she had this sense, she realised that whatever it was that God was calling her to, it was something that would be greatly to his glory. And she says she was held for two hours with nothing but the sound glory, glory, glory ringing in her ears. And there are two things. First of all, the Jesuit motto is ad maiorem dei gloriam, to the greater glory of God. So glory is a very kind of key buzzword that connects her with the Jesuits and Ignatius of Loyola and their spirituality and their religious charism as an order. But also, whenever I'm talking about this, I remind people of St. Irenaeus of Lyon, who in the second century said, the glory of God is a human being fully alive. And, you know, at the beginning of the 17th century, there were very strong beliefs, both cultural and secular, but also religious, theological, that a woman was not a human being fully alive, that actually she was, as Thomas Aquinas says at one point, a misbegotten male. The the prime model was the male human being and that a woman was just a kind of secondary, you know. And here is Mary Ward, the rest of whose life is dedicated to expressing and developing the notion that the glory of God is a female human being fully alive. So there's something very exciting for me as a feminist theologian in that notion. But I think it was also an extraordinary thing in her time, this sense that women can have a really primary relationship with God, a direct relationship with God. And she gives a talk to her sisters about 12 years later, and she's talking about an encounter she had with a Jesuit who had been on the English mission. And this is what she says to them. There was a father lately came from England who said that he would not for 10,000 worlds be a woman because a woman could not comprehend God. I answered nothing, but only smiled. I could have answered from the experience I have of the contrary. I could have been sorry for his want of judgment. I mean not his judgment, for he is a man of a very good judgment. His want is inexperience. I love that. Don't you love that? It's just so perfectly on point. It's totally on point. And, you know, she's trying to be kind and she's trying to be polite. And she understands. And I mean, she's got three amazing speeches which she gives where she kind of unpacks all this. She realizes that his theology is not helping him because he's working out of a theology that says only a male human being can have a kind of direct line to God. And women have it in some secondary kind of sense. And we know that she was very well educated. She and most of her sisters were conversant in Latin, some of them in Greek, certainly in in various European languages. They knew the scriptures. She certainly knew her scriptures extremely well. So she hadn't had a formal theological training, but she knew her theology. And she knew this couldn't be true. And she knew it because of the experience she had of the contrary. But then she allows her experience to inform her theology. 
Whereas this guy was working on theology and he didn't have the experience to tell him any different. And so she's making that kind of contrast and saying, well, you know, it's not that he's stupid. It's not that he's bad. It's just that he's never lived anything different. So how would he know? And I suppose how could he understand a woman's relationship with God when he himself has never been a woman? Indeed. And also if everything in his theology is telling him this, and also he's not been around women as equals, as collaborators. And so, you know, at the very heart of all of this is her conviction, I think, that the glory of God is alive and well and living in women as well as in men. And that's one of the things that that I love about her. So avid listeners may be thinking back to the Augustine Baker episode that we had about the question of the involvement of Jesuits in female religious communities. So how did they get involved in Mary Ward's case? It is such a story. So she gathered this bunch of young women together. They were a kind of a connected network of families, cousins and people. And they all sailed off to Saint Omer together in 1609, where there was a big Jesuit college. And they went off to live together in community, to live a life of prayer and penance and discernment. They wanted to discern together, well, what exactly is God calling us to? And they got permission to live together. They opened a little school so that they were beginning to educate the daughters of English people who wanted their daughters educated in the Catholic faith. And then in 1611, she had this, again, another revelation. She wasn't well. She was lying in her room. And she says she heard it intellectually. So it was a kind of an inner voice that said, take the same of the society. Father General will never permit it. Go to him. So number one, Take the same rule, the same rule of life, the constitutions of the Jesuits. That's the first thing you've got to do, says God. Number two, the general superior of the Jesuits will never let you do this. So I'm asking you to do something that's completely impossible and forbidden, but never mind, go and do it anyway. <laughs> and that's really the story of the rest of her life. So they all took this very much on board and they began to live as women Jesuits. And she persuaded a Jesuit friend of hers, who was a rather extraordinary English missionary, one of the only men that had ever escaped from the Tower of London, a Jesuit called John Gerard, he lent her his copy of the Jesuit constitutions, and she copied it all down. This is how we're going to live now. The difficulty for her was that Ignatius himself had had a very troubled experience with women trying to follow him and live the Jesuit life. And it all went horribly wrong. So he actually put into the Jesuit constitutions, there must never be a female branch of this order. We are never going to have responsibility for women religious. It's just too much trouble. And actually, we need to be as mobile as possible. Well, Mary Ward was saying, I don't want to be dependent on the Jesuits. I don't want to be dependent on anyone but God. That's fine. We'll just take the constitutions and we'll live the life. But that meant being completely free from monastic enclosure and various papal bulls, including one called Periculoso, dangerous, it kind of, the title gives it away, insisted that all religious women must live under papal enclosure. So... After St. Angela Merici, she was the first to really, really try and say, no, we don't need to live like this. We can live an unenclosed life. And it was a huge success. I mean, houses multiplied all over Europe from Perugia to Prague. And we had hidden communities in England. We had sisters in the what's now in Flanders. And, you know, there were various rulers and cardinals and bishops who actually saw the point of having educated women and women educated in their faith. But in Rome, it was shock, horror, scandal. This is totally impossible. Women on the loose is the equivalent of loose women. And, you know, we can't have this. And the Jesuits themselves were hugely divided. So some of them were very enthusiastic because they'd worked with these women. They'd seen what could be done. And others said, look, we're having enough problems already with the diocesan clergy in England who, who think we're interlopers, 
and other people who are very suspicious of us. We don't want to get mixed up with these crazy women. It's only going to prove to be troublesome. And the Jesuit general superior is saying it's very clear in the constitutions. We cannot have a female branch. We don't involve ourselves with these women. So she found herself in a lot of trouble very fast. And throughout the 1620s, great struggles to kind of survive. She crossed the Alps on foot three times, walking through the armies of the Thirty Years' War, walking through the bubonic plague to get to Rome to present her petition to exist, to get papal approval. And the Pope kept saying, oh, yes, yes, my dear, I really will look into it. And while he was saying that to her face, he was preparing a bull of suppression behind her back, and he never told her that. So she was arrested as a heretic, schismatic, and rebel to holy faith in 1631. She was arrested by the Inquisition and was imprisoned, actually, ironically, in a Port Clare monastery in uh, Munich. And all the houses were suppressed, and all the sisters' vows were nullified, and notices were put up in four places in Rome telling everybody that this had happened and that this was, you know, a disgrace to the Holy Church. And these women were poisonous growths who had to be ripped out by the roots. I mean, the, the language is terribly violent. And it basically said, we cannot have women who aspire to being religious who are not living the monastic life. So there was a complete failure to understand the possibility of living a religious life, a fully dedicated life, without monastic enclosure. So the idea of the mysticism of the everyday, the mysticism of the ordinary, sank like a stone, basically. And is that how things ended for her? Ooh, no, because as we know, you can't keep a good woman down. You absolutely cannot. All right. So what happens to her from there? She was set free, went to see the Pope again and said, I am not and never have been a heretic. And the Pope said, yeah, I know. <laughs> So he was actually very keen on her as a human being. He just didn't like, you know, the show that went with it. And so he took her and her sisters under his personal protection, but they were constantly being watched by the Inquisition. They were forbidden to live together. Eventually, they managed to get a bit of permission that they could actually live together because they were all penniless by this stage. Most of them had brought their dowries with them and spent it on just trying to survive. Or some of them had never received their dowries because their families refused to give them to them in an order that wasn't approved. And if I can jump back from this time to 1615. So again, they're still trying to find their way. And it's not only she's trying to find her way for her sisters, but I think she's trying to find a way for women in the church. And she writes this beautiful letter to her Jesuit spiritual director, Roger Lee, about Again, another kind of vision, intuition that we call the vision of the just soul. And this is really, I think, the manifesto of her mystical vision. And I won't read it all, but this is what she says to him. Because she's seen a state of soul that a person can attain to that belongs to those who follow in this dream of being women Jesuits. So she says, it seems a certain clear and perfect estate to be had in this life, and such a one as is altogether needful for those that should well discharge the duties of this institute, meaning her religious order. I never read of any I can compare in likeness to it. It is not like the state of saints, whose holiness chiefly appears in that union with God which maketh them out of themselves. I perceived then an apparent difference and yet felt myself drawn to love and desire this state more than all those favours. So she's trying to talk about a state of soul that her sisters are called to. And she says, well, it's not mysticism in the sense of having raptures and visions and, you know, ecstasies. It's not that union of God which maketh them out of themselves, which is what she means by that. And she then goes on, the felicity of this state, for as much as I can express, was a singular freedom from all that could make one adhere to earthly things, with an entire application and apt disposition to all good works. Something happened also, discovering the freedom that such a soul should have 
to refer all to God. I seemed in my understanding to see a soul thus composed, but far more fair than I can express it. And that idea for us of a singular freedom, it's what's at the heart of the Jesuit spiritual exercises, where he talks about liberating oneself or allowing God to liberate us from disordered attachments and coming to a, such a deep sense of inner freedom that anything and everything in this world, anything in the created world can lead us to a deeper experience of God. And that's a very, very key part of the Ignatian vision of God in all things. And it's very much part of Mary Ward's vision as well. And she then links the whole thing back to primeval innocence before the fall and says, it then occurred and still continues in my mind that those in paradise before the first fall were in this estate. It seemed to me then, and that hope remains still, that our Lord let me see it to invite me that way. And because he would give me grace in time to arrive to such an estate, at least in some degree. That word justice and those in former times that were called just persons, works of justice done in innocency, and that we be such as we appear and appear such as we are. These things often since occurred to my mind with a liking of them. I had moreover thought upon this occasion that perhaps this course of ours would continue till the end of the world because it came to that in which we first began. So that idea of we be such as we appear and appear such as we are, it's kind of what you see is what you get. And the idea that we can be returned to that union of God before the fall, where Adam and Eve kind of walked with God in the cool of the evening in the garden and everything was in harmony together. She talks about works of justice done in innocency. And before she talks about an, an apt disposition for all good works. So she doesn't see apostolic workers in any way getting between a soul and God. She doesn't see it as a distraction. She sees this is where we live our mystical life. It's the mysticism of the ordinary, the mysticism of the everyday. And if you notice in the current writings of Pope Francis, who of course himself is also a Jesuit, he talks about the God of little things. And there is a real sense of this God of the ordinary and of the capacity of human beings to become what God always intended them to be. And is that how things ended for her? Did she die a heretic? Definitely. And we, we know from other things that she wrote that she actually resisted this. Oh, okay. What does that mean? Well, I suspect that if she resisted it, it's because occasionally she felt a draw towards it or, a, you know, that she was going that way. But she was resistant to it, I think, because it didn't seem to her to be consistent with this vision of the just soul she had, that we be such as we appear and we appear such as we are. So for us, justice, sincerity, transparency are really key elements of our own understanding of our spirituality. Okay, so let's jump back into her life then. What happened next? Well, they just kind of went on doing their thing. And in Bavaria, where the Thirty Years' War was raging, the elector of Bavaria, Maximilian, he'd been educated by the Jesuits. He knew the worth of a Jesuit education in terms of really embedding the Catholic faith in a family and a person. And he saw, he absolutely understood Mary Ward's point, that if you educate the women, you educate the family, you know. So he basically said, look, I'm not interested in your quarrel with the Pope. If you ladies want to live together a pious life and run a school, I'm happy to have you here in Bavaria. So that's what they carried on doing. There was a small group in Rome. There was a small group in Bavaria. There was a very small group living in hiding in England. And that was all that was left because most of the other sisters actually left the order, realizing there was no future in it, and joined other orders if they could get them to accept them. But we know, for instance, that the year after the suppression, a young girl called Frances Bedingfield, who'd come over from England to be educated with Mary Ward's sisters, made her vows privately 
in the Church of Santa Maria Maggiore in Rome. So even a year after the suppression, there were English girls coming over and saying, yeah, I'm going to make vows with these people. I think it was helpful probably that the people who were leading this order were English women who had never lived under a bishop. They'd never had a hierarchy. They'd been brought up in a completely flat structure in Catholic England because, you know, priests were forbidden, bishops didn't exist. Lay Catholics of that time learned to trust in their own authority, really. And so they did this for a while. And then Mary Ward and her sisters felt drawn to go back to England. So they got permission to travel. And there was a family, a very strong Catholic family called the Gascoynes, who were landowners up in Yorkshire. And Thomas Gascoigne said, will you come to Yorkshire and establish a school for our young women and a community and I'll give you a house? So that's what they did. And by this time, the clouds were gathering in England of the English Civil War and the Civil War did break out. So they were living in Yorkshire during the siege of York with cannons barking everywhere and, you know, armies fighting all around them when Mary Ward was dying. And she actually died in the middle of the Siege of York in 1645. And she just had a small group of sisters around her. And they buried her just outside York in an Anglican church where they said the vicar was honest enough to be bribed. (laughs) And um, fascinatingly, despite the fact that Catholicism was forbidden and things, her grave was marked as a kind of a holy place even by Anglicans and nonconformist people who were not Catholics, they recognized this as the grave of a holy woman. And um, the sisters just kind of quietly carried on doing what they could. They escaped to Paris eventually when Charles II had to flee. But when the restoration of the monarchy came, many Catholics hoped that things would get easier in England, so they came back to England. And in 1686... Frances Beddingfield, the girl who had taken her vows as a young 16-year-old, she founded the first post-Reformation religious house in England, which is the Bar Convent in York. And we've been there ever since. And we lived as secret sisters. It was a kind of secret everybody knew. We've been there ever since 1686. So the Bar Convent in York is still the oldest extant convent in England. And in the meantime, we just kept steadily fighting for recognition, some form of approval. And in Germany, they managed to get approval by the Bishop of Augsburg, where we'd been since the 1660s. And bit by bit, we just got permission to live, not as official sisters, but nobody was too worried as long as we didn't get too official about it all. But as far as they were concerned, they were the descendants of Mary Ward and and her first sisters, and they took vows and, you know, carried on. This has so many echoes of the begging movement and the idea of a female religious community not necessarily being formally recognized, but left to their own devices as long as they don't make too much noise. Exactly. It's exactly what was happening. And eventually there was a big push in the mid 18th century to get this sorted out. There was a bishop who got very worried and sent to Rome. And Pope Benedict XIV, who at the time was was a canon lawyer, said, okay, I'm going to make a decision. Basically, I am allowing you to exist. I give you permission as long as you realize you are not the order founded by Mary Ward. You cannot claim Mary Ward as your founder because that order was suppressed forever. And this was, oh, it's such a tragic moment in our history. I can hardly bear to tell it. This was where the sisters themselves went rummaging around, found a whole load of papers and letters and things, and burnt them all, destroyed it. And up in York, we've got this fabulous historical library and gorgeous archives. I mean, for any historian of women's religious life, it's just fascinating. We've actually got books which had her name in it, and the sisters took a knife and cut the name out of the book so as to prove that they were being obedient. And that was kind of very sad. Every bone in my body is angry about this. I can't believe it went from smash the patriarchy, let's educate women, no hierarchy, to let's destroy books. But, you know, 200 years later, kind of the memory had got a bit faint. But interestingly enough, 
there was always one or two who stuck to it and also stuck to her. And by this time, the paintings, we had put the paintings up. The bishop told us to take them down. We took them down. Then he died and we put them back up again. And the next bishop said, take them down. So the painting life was hidden for 75 years on and off. But somehow we did preserve the memory of Mary Ward. And we kept pushing. And there was a huge push in the late 19th century. Lots of archive work done, a wonderful two-volume biography written by a woman who had been an Anglican sister, had gone out to the Crimea with Florence Nightingale. Uh, she was a feisty lass, and she wrote this biography. And in 1909, so, you know, 300 years after the founding of the Institute, we at last got approbation for Mary Ward herself and vindication for her. And we at last got permission to exist as the order founded by Mary Ward. But, you know, by this time, there were hundreds all over the world because a lovely Irish woman called Teresa Ball, whose anniversary it is this year, in the 1820s, had come over to York to the Bar Convent to do her novitiate, had taken the order back to Ireland and then had gone out in this great missionary. I mean, she was a tremendous missionary. And by that stage, we had sisters in India, we had them in Mauritius, we had them in Canada, the stories of the Canadian sisters, unbelievable what they went through. Ghastly story of a sister having her foot cut off without anaesthetic on the kitchen table. I mean, really gruesome tales. But if these women who had this passion, not only for this way of life, but actually for Mary Ward herself. So, you know, it was a sort of story that was told in whispers. And it's a very subversive story in many ways. But it's a story that people hung on to for centuries. And has Mary Ward received some sort of formal recognition now? Just after 2009, she was pronounced venerable. So that's the first, sort of first step on the ladder to being canonized. And, you know, it's not that we want her canonized to kind of be able to have statues and stuff. I want her canonized out of justice, justice to women in the church, but also justice to Mary Ward herself. And... They keep telling us in Rome, well, you see, you've got to have a miracle. We need a miracle. And we say, look, the miracle is that we survived. That's the miracle. I mean, given everything you've said, I don't see how they could possibly argue with that. Returning for a moment to Mary Ward's spirituality, I'm just wondering, what was God like in her description? Hers is a, a spirituality very much of a God of kindness, a God of loving kindness. And she talks a lot in her letters and things about kindness. And at one point, she wrote letters when she was in prison. She wasn't allowed to communicate with anybody, but it was an English recusant thing to write letters in lemon juice, which, of course, were invisible until you put them near a candle or fire and the fire cooked the lemon juice and the letters came out. So this is how she communicated in secret with her sisters. And we have some of these lemon juice letters, you know, and clearly the sisters had been saying, oh, we're going to do penance. We're really going to fast and we're going to take the discipline and all this stuff until you come out. And she writes back and says, no, I'm not having any of that. I want you all to go to bed and have, you know, a good night's sleep. And I want you to sing and I want you to dance and I want you to rejoice. And I'm having none of this gloomy stuff. <laughs> it's very human somehow. She not only sounds human, she sounds like a very good human. Very kind and reasonable in her expectations. Yes, yes, definitely. And and her her letters to her sisters, she teases them. They're very loving, they're very kindly, but she also pokes fun at them. And sometimes clearly one or two of them have gone a bit overboard with the piety. And she just kind of deflates it in the nicest possible way, says, you know, what's going on here, you know? Because, of course, they didn't drink water because it was contaminated. They tended to drink beer. And in one of the houses, the beer had gone sour. So one of the sisters dipped a crucifix in it to try and see if she could make the beer, I don't know, sort of get better. And uh, Mary Ward writes back and says, have you become a brewer? I mean, why? You know, so there's always that note of also cheerfulness. And she says at one point, while she's in prison, in such times, mirth is only second to virtue. You know, joyfulness, mirth was enormously important to her. 
and she talks a lot about the need to be joyful and cheerful. Excellent things to be. Now, we are coming to the end of the podcast, so I have to ask you the big question, which of course is, why is Mary Ward your favourite mystic? Mary Ward is my favourite mystic because she's so human and she makes me realise, and I think she helps other people to realise, that a really deep, deep life of prayer, a really intimate relationship with Jesus is possible for dead ordinary people. It's within our grasp and it's within our grasp because God puts it within our grasp. And I just think that's a hugely heartening and hopeful message. And a great one to end on. Gemma, thank you so much for joining me today and for telling me all about Mary Ward's fascinating life. It's been my huge pleasure. And thank you for giving me the opportunity to talk about my favorite subject. Absolutely. It was great having you. And thank you all for listening. You can follow us on Twitter at MyFaveMystic, where I'll be posting some of the pictures from The Painted Life. Also, an admin note, we are going to be taking a couple of weeks off, so our next episode will be up on January 20th, 2022. So join me then when I speak to the wonderful Jessica Barr about Gertrude von Helfte.